I'm so glad you're here with me today at the Fire Mountain Gems and Beads studio. We have a really elegant, fun project to do today. Over 10 years ago, Swarovski uh, came out with components that I thought were some of the most unique and innovative I've ever seen in my life. And they're the Cosmic Crystal Series, and they come in all different shapes. But I was particularly enthralled with the little squares here. They also come in circles. And you can get them in different sizes, too. But the ones that I do this type of work with the most are the ones that are the 20 millimeter by 20 millimeter size. So we're gonna work with the 20 millimeter Cosmic Crystal Square today. And I work with all the colors because they're just delicious. But one of my favorite polymer clay techniques is to enhance things with borders and um, embellishments that are made from striping and clay. And if you're familiar with my work, you'll see that quite often. But it's deceptively difficult to do striping. It sounds easy because you're just stacking a layer upon layer of clay and then just repeating that. Uh, but to get a good result, a result with some precision and clean straight lines is a little harder than most people think going into it. And it all comes down to the tips and tricks. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today as we build this from just a simple, elegant cosmic crystal square into something a bit more. So we start with that and we've conditioned our clay. Use any colors you like. But for the most impact, I, I want contrast. And of course, the biggest contrast difference we're gonna see in color is between black and white. So those are the clay colors I've selected for today. But don't be shy about drawing this with other colors. So it all begins with a little ball of clay, about the size of a pea. We'll set it right there in the middle there. And that one I already baked, just so I had one already to go with. But I'm gonna form it into the shape of a square. Doesn't have to be perfect. So we're gonna press this down inside of our piece. But we wanna put a backing on it to hold it into place. So we're gonna pick it up and we're gonna work on a piece of parchment or baking paper, I call it deli paper. They sandwich meat patties at the deli in those or it's the paper you find when you go pick out donuts at the self-serve bakery. But we're just gonna smoosh it with our finger until it fills the corners, mostly fills the corners anyway. And then we wanna put it on another backing of clay. Now how thick it needs to be really depends on your clay machine, but I find that even though the third largest setting on one clay machine can be much thicker or thinner than another, pretty thin's okay, but the third or the fourth largest setting should be thick enough. We don't wanna make it real thick and chunky. We, we just wanna support the back. So what we're gonna do is lay this down and we're gonna take a little bit of the polybonder glue. This is the high temperature heat safe glue that's rated for baking with clay. And it's an instant bonding glue. We're wiping off most of the glue. Now this particular design is foiled on the back. The glue is not gonna hurt it, neither will the baking. Swarovski crystals withstand temperatures up to 650 degrees, which is way above the recommended baking temperatures for all brands of polymer clay. So we're gonna set our piece down on the backing and press it down and give it just a few seconds to bond. Your crystal, as you work with it, is gonna get a little bit um, dull. That's just the clay residue from your hands. Your project is easily cleaned up after you've baked it with just a alcohol on a cotton swab. All right, so that's enough for it to grab and it's stuck. But I don't know if you can see here, let's take a look. There's a little undercut in these crystals, so there's a little ledge underneath here. And we're gonna wanna put our striping up against the sides. Do we have to fill it? No, we don't. But if we do, it's gonna give us a nice clean wall to build our striping against. So you can even take scrap clay. Um, you've heard me say it on other videos, that scrap clay, there's wonderful uses for scrap clay. There's utilitarian uses, there's decorative purposes, but this one's more utilitarian. I'm just gonna take some scrap clay and you can roll it in your hands or roll it against your work surface. And I'm just going to pinch it down here to make it a bit triangular. And we're gonna push that right into that crevice. So we're just trying to fill that gap and you can either cut it into four pieces and do that, or you can wrap it like I'm doing here. Just getting that, that tight little area you pinched, just pushing it in and filling that gap. So with my clay blade, I'm cutting this towards me. I know you can't see that, back towards the camera. And we're just gonna push it in like so. 
Now, make sure you're standing or looking directly down over your work. Blade control depends on making sure that you know when your blade is straight up and down or angled. And a lot of people work with their blade sitting behind it, and they really don't know that they're holding their blade at an angle. So looking straight down over your piece, you wanna just trim this, trim away that scrap, but what it will leave is that gap that's all filled in. And it's ready to receive stripes. So let's learn how to make those and make them the right way. So it doesn't matter which color you start with. I've got the white here first, but it's really important that you have a sheet of clay that's gonna be the same size. Now in some of the techniques that I do, I don't care if the clay, when I rolled it through my machine, has a little fold in it. That doesn't matter in some cases. In this case, it's best to have a nice clean sheet with no folded crevices in there because we don't want that to interrupt the structure of the stripe. So let's lay this down on our work surface. And when you're working with a bigger sheet, I've shown this in other videos, we gently want to smooth it down. We don't want to trap air between the layers of clay. And again, using our blades straight up and down, we're going to trim away the excess, and then we're going to thin this. Now, how thick or thin your stripes are is all a matter of personal preference and taste. I have a formula that I use for a lot of my striping. I don't stick with it all the time, but it, it's the formula I like for a lot of the work I do. On my machine at home, I like to work on the third largest setting. So each of these layers was rolled out on the third largest setting, and then uh, I stack the two together. But you can do stripes, one that's thicker against one that's thinner. There's just really no limit to how you can design a stripe. You can even use more than two colors. But we're gonna keep it simple for now because if you can master this, you can do anything with striping. Lifting it up without stretching it by angling our blade and shimming it under there, we're gonna go to our clay machine. Now, you wanna start on the largest setting of the machine. You don't wanna damage the guide blades by pushing clay that's too thick through a thin setting and we're gonna roll slowly, and that allows any air that might get trapped in there to come out, and I found a little inclusion in there. That's what happens when you have pets and things. So you see that stretched it quite a bit, but I wanna reduce it even thinner. If you're not sure how thick you like your stripes before you advance to a thinner setting that you may not like, you can always just lop off a little bit from one edge and take a look at the striping to see how thick it is and see if you like it where it's at or you wanna go a little thinner. So I'm gonna take this one setting thinner. Now my machine at home, uh, the third largest setting is very similar to the second largest setting on the machine I'm working with here today in the studio. So if you see the contamination on there, I used to panic about that, don't worry. We're just stacking black over it, so it's gonna hide that contamination. And you can use a ruler. Uh, I usually like to eyeball it. So, and I don't have to make my sheet exact. There's a reason I like to have excess clay when I do stripe loaves, and we'll talk about that when we get to that stage. So I'm gonna cut it and stack it. And again, very gently, without a lot of pressure, we don't wanna create valleys in our stripes. We're just gonna smooth it from one end to the other so air doesn't become trapped. That's something I emphasize a lot, but I don't think you can emphasize it too much. And I'm gonna cut it in half again, and lift it up, and stack it. You can start to see that nice stripe forming. Now, how tall should it be? Well, it depends on how much clay you started with. I started with a half a bar of both the black and half a bar of the white, half a bar of each. So I am gonna cut off a little of this excess off the back and set it in my scrap pile. Cutting it in half again, either with a ruler or if you're good with spatial relationships, you can eyeball it. And just stacking and gently smoothing down. Don't compress it too hard. I'm gonna cut it in half and stack one more time. Now you don't wanna want end up with a loaf that's super, super tall and narrow, but for this project, if I have striping that is wide enough to cover each side without having to abut multiple slices together, that's really ideal for me. So here we go, we're going to stack it again just light compression. We don't want to change the width of any of those stripes. Distortion is, is the problem. So you, you can see right there, I'm going to turn it towards me because um, when, we, when we work on in front of a camera, oftentimes we try to slice in front of us. And I think people pick that up and do that at home. But really the proper way when you're cutting a millefiori cane or a stripe loaf is to face it towards you so you can see what you're doing. The only reason people learn to do it that way is they think that's how they're supposed to. 
but that's just for the camera. So I'm gonna slice a clean bit off of here and I wanna show you just how pretty that striping looks. If there's any contamination on your blade, any clay residue or glue from another project that's right on there, it can create a drag line that's gonna distort the stripe. So always make sure your blade is clean and sharp. That's really, really important. So I'm gonna show you something really dramatic. We wanna make sure that we cut it the right way. So that's the first most important tip in striping. The stripes need to lie down. So they're, they're parallel with your work surface or they're horizontal. If you cut your loaf with the stripes facing up, with each cut you're applying pressure, the stripes are gonna bow on the outer edges and it's gonna continue with each slice you make and they're gonna get more and more round and distorted. So we start the same way we start our day, we're lying down. So we cut our stripes lying down. But let me just show you how dramatic this is. I'm gonna cut a fairly thick slice. This is about an eighth of an inch thick. And I am going to cut this in half. And I'm gonna take it to the clay machine. And I'm gonna reduce it down quite a bit, quite thin. Now the second tip, we slice lying down, but it's important how you roll your stripes. I'm not gonna tell you that to do this the way you shouldn't is wrong. It's not wrong, it's just different. If you want clean, precise striping, you always roll it with the stripes facing up or vertically. So the opposite of the way we slice is the way we roll. So I'm gonna put this in the clay machine with the stripes facing up, and I'm putting this other half with the stripes parallel to the machine. And on a very thin setting, I'm gonna show you just how dramatic this effect is. So this is really thin to the point where it actually caused the striping to tear a little bit. That, that's okay. I still can show you what I mean. I think it's pretty obvious here. The side with the stripes facing up, you can see it's nice and clean and the stripes maintain their integrity. But the, this one, you get a zebra effect. That's why I said it's not wrong, it's just different. So if you want the effect of zebra striping, now you know how to do it. So let's go back and prepare our stripes for our machine and I'm gonna share with you one of my favorite clay tips of all time. So I'm looking for slices that are, again, about an eighth of, eighth of an inch thick, but I'm not sure they're gonna be that thick. Here's a tip about slicing. So when you slice, you're looking straight down over the top of your blade to make sure your blade is straight up and down, not at an angle, because then we're cutting a wedge, aren't we? Straight up and down. But it's okay to turn and look from the side to make sure as you pull down that you're cutting it the same thickness all the way through. Another tip, especially if your blade's a little more flexible, if you pull out on the edges, you put tension in the blade and you're gonna get a cleaner slice. So for that reason, sometimes I like to work with a thinner blade that's a little more flexible because the thinner the blade, the sharper it's gonna be. Sometimes you'll want your striping to rest for a few days and firm up, but with the Fimo clays, I find I can cut right into them with little or no distortion right after I work with them. So I'm gonna turn this back towards me and I'm going to cut a stripe or a slice that's a little more than an eighth, eighth of an inch thick. And look what happened here. I don't know if you can see that. There's a little line in there. That meant there was something on my blade. That's okay, I'll work around it. I might have enough striping to do my whole piece. So here's a tip. Oftentimes our play machines, no matter how much we take care of them and clean them, little bits come out. I call them the hitchhikers. They hitch a right on your clay and it ruins the piece that you're running through. So if you take a piece of parchment or baking paper and you cover the clay with it as you go to roll it through, all those little hitchhikers are gonna be on the paper and not your clay. When you're doing a big piece, you never put the two in together, you feed the paper in gradually, giving the clay a chance to stretch but the paper won't stretch. You don't want it to buckle and wrinkle on your clay. So I'm gonna go back to my largest setting. We'll start there. And with my stripes facing up, I'm going to just roll it enough to grab and separate my paper. And now I get a uniform thickness. So I'm gonna reduce it down one more setting because I wanna see my stripes not just from the sides of my piece, like here, but from the front. So we're looking at it from two, two profiles. All right, so into the machine again, separating my paper and re-rolling my stripes, making it just slightly thinner. And we're gonna leave it like that and peel the paper off. So you notice how there's a lot of distortion. Let's take a look at it from here. A lot of distortion at the top and the bottom and the outside stripes, that's normal. Oftentimes uh, in books and videos, editors will like us to cut this and make it perfect. 
I don't like to do it because that means more wasted clay. And it's not truly wasted, it goes into my scraps for another use. But the more scrap that you leave, the less distortion you're gonna have, you're gonna have more usable stripe to work with. And you'll also probably get a couple more slices out of the back if you leave that, that end on there. So we'll set that aside. And I am going to cut this a little bit wider than I know my, the thicknesses of my crystal. And we're gonna come back to our crystal that we set aside here. And with just a tiny bit of glue, we're gonna conceal that scrap clay. That's all gonna disappear. Nobody's even gonna know it's in there. And we're gonna pick this up and just dab a tiny bead of glue across there. And I'm going to align this with the top edge of the crystal. And then again, here's, the, the, here's a handy tip with the parchment paper. If I put it down like this, I can trim from the front and the, or the back and the sides. If I need to do it from the front, usually you don't if you align it well. And you continue doing that until you've wrapped all the way around. And we're gonna do that because we're gonna add an embellishment. The problem with striping is on corners, it's hard to get your stripes to meet up really beautifully around corners. So the best way to do that is to camouflage it with a little embellishment. And it's the same embellishment we're gonna use to make our design in the center. Even though this is a tiny little canvas, it has a lot of impact. And there's so many different ways you can design the center. We're gonna make some really simple, very quick, Millefiori cane leaves. And that's what we're gonna do on the center and on our corners. So here we go. And line that up. And I just trim one at a time. Now if you like, you can go ahead and bake do, decorate your center first and bake it with the backing on so when you handle it you don't run the risk of getting any other clay on there but we're going to do this in real time okay last one and sometimes if you find you've got some distortion on one side of your striping the other side might be clean and usable so I was able to avoid that whole area where I got the drag line all together and out of just one slice I had enough to complete the framing of this entire crystal. Okay, so now for the really fun part. We're gonna make a quick and easy Millefiori cane. So some of you know how to do this, but if you're new to clay, this is a great way to learn how to do some Millefiori without feeling too intimidated. So I'm taking white clay, and my hands are a little bit dirty. You can clean it with a baby wipe, but it doesn't matter because I'm wrapping it in black anyway. And we're gonna make a little marshmallow out of this ball of clay. Just compress it and roll it and flatten it a bit. I've already rolled out some black polymer clay on a real thin setting, and we're going to just wrap this right around it. So we'll lay it on our work surface and trim it so that it's as wide as this little marshmallow is long. This goes out of the way. And you wanna start with a nice clean edge at the beginning of your wrap. So it looks like that. And we're going to roll, so watch this. This is a slick trick. Rolling up and rolling back. And I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of hard to tell. I'm going to angle it a little bit and see if we can get light. There's a little line that the, the front end of our wrap creates in the clay. And we can cut just inside that line. And that shows us, and then our clay will wrap right up to that seam. Okay. Now we're going to reduce this by squeezing and compressing. We don't have to worry about distortion, so we can actually roll this to make it smaller. So this is a lot of leaves. This is enough for me to make several dozen pendants, believe it or not, just this little bit. So I don't need that much. We'll start with a little bit there, and I'm gonna roll it. Now when you work with Millefiori, most of the time you don't do much rolling, but there's nothing inside of my design that can distort or twist, so we can just ex reduce it down that way. I'd like leaves that are about an eighth of an inch across diameter when I've got this rolled down, so we'll cut a little off and I've got more to save for later. Then we're going to pinch it on just one edge, okay? And that makes our teardrop shape. So now we're working teeny tiny. And the way we cut a teardrop shape is we cut not straight down through with our blade, ka-chunk, 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 we cut down like we're skiing down a mountain, like our blade is the skier. We start at the top and we pull down in an angular motion with every slice. Again, your clay will be firmer after it's had a chance to rest. And then we're gonna flip it with every slice. 
And by doing that, we help avoid distortion and maintain that shape. And again, looking straight down over your blade gives you the chance to be a little bit more precise in your striping. So we come back to the center here and let's take a look real quick at some designs. There's designs that are more complicated in Melifiori where you can introduce a vein line inside. I'm going to show you a trick how we can create that illusion. And here I've used four leaves. Here I've used three. In this one I've used eight. Okay. So a lot of different designs in that tiny little canvas. So what we would do, let's just do a quick one with four. And I'm going to pick up my slices and I'm going to go in from the corners on this one. And if you find you do have distortion in your background clay, in this case it's white, you can always go in there with a needle tool or a toothpick or a stylus and stipple the background and camouflage that. So these all get aligned with the corners in the middle and you can adjust them. And that little trick about making it look like there's a vein line in there, you can take a toothpick or a needle tool or an awl and you can usually drag down through the middle and that will create the illusion of a vein line. Sometimes you pick up a little of that black clay. And lastly, because the centers usually don't look too good, I'm going to camouflage that. Again, it's all about hiding the things you don't like in your work and emphasizing the things you do. So a little ball of black clay pressed into the middle and we're going to finish that off with a little flatback Swarovski crystal. I'm going to take uh, this wonderful crystal katana here. Whoops, push a little bit harder and pick it up and set it in the middle and press it down in place. And that black clay is going to come right up around there and make a frame that creates a natural bezel, locking it in place. And um, also uh, make sure that the stone won't fall out. So that's especially nice if you're working with a non-hot fix stone, but I do prefer the Swarovski hot fix. So again, I would come in here, do four more leaves, and we would cap off the center and bake it five or ten minutes to heat set, and it's going to look like that. Now we need to hang it. So you have a lot of options. And my favorite is to use a glue-on bale, and you might design from uh, this perspective so that it, it faces square or you might do it from an angular perspective in a corner. It's up to you. It doesn't have to be a bale. It can be a piece of wire or an eye pin. It can also be a decorative jump ring that you sandwich between another layer of clay. So after baking I would roll out some clay thick enough to sandwich and support my bale. I'd glue that in place first, cover it up. I would texture it and then I'd trim it. And let's take a look here. Here's one I textured with some coarse sandpaper and trimmed it up. So you've got a truly finished look from the front to the back. You can even extend an eye pin, putting a little bend in the middle so it doesn't pull out or it can't twist on you, to make little dangles and really enhance your work even more. So just because it's a smaller, smaller crystal doesn't mean you can't play with it and enhance it and add to it with clay. And I think you can see here that the two are a really beautiful combination together. So if you've enjoyed this project, don't forget to share it with your friends and your family members. Put it on your Facebook page or Pinterest or wherever you like in your social networking. And thank you so much for coming to play around with me today at Fire Mountain Gems and Beads Jewelry Design Studio.